Hello and welcome to Food Safety Fridays. My name is Simon Timpley from the International Food Safety and Quality Network. It's great to be here with you today. And today's special guest is Angela O'Donovan uh, from BRCGS. And today's subject is lessons from the pandemic on food safety and certification. So welcome, Angela. Thank you very much, Simon. Delighted to be here today. Very good. And uh, it's your first webinar today, isn't it? It is, yes. yes. So I'm not nervous, I promise. <laughs> well, there's only about 900 people registered, so there's nothing to be nervous about. No, everybody's friendly. So you can see in the sidebar there, Angela, you know, they're saying hello, hello from Belgrade, Missouri, USA, Philippines, Rome, mm -hmm. uh, Amazing. Texas, literally all over the world. So mm -hmm. it's great. Oh, that's right. That's lovely. Good evening. Yeah, people saying good yeah. evening, greetings. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so what we'll do is, as we do each week, I'll play the uh, video ads from the sponsors and then we'll be back for the presentation. So we're back in a, a couple of minutes. Okay. In the last hundred years. But one thing that doesn't change? Ensuring the quality and safe handling of food. No matter what changes are yet to come, we're proud to always be on our client's side, shaping the future of food today and tomorrow. AIB International, ever onward. Oh, <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Um, right, let's get the slides up and without further ado, uh, we'll have the presentation from Angela and I'll be back for the Q&A later. Okay. Okay, so I just want to say good morning or good afternoon or even good evening to everyone joining today's webinar. Um, from wherever you are around the world. It's great to see so many of you joining. 
Um, so my name is Angela O'Donovan. So my name is Angela O'Donovan and I'm the head of the BRCGS, the head of standards at BRCGS. And today I'm just going to discuss the lessons learned from the pandemic on food safety and certification. Before I start, I just wanted again just to say thank you to Simon at IFSQN for giving me the opportunity to present today. So, my goodness, who can believe we've been in this pandemic for a year? It really has disrupted our lives so much. And one thing that hasn't changed, though, is that food safety is still a priority for manufacturing sites. And we all know that food safety is a priority for our customers, <clears throat> for our specifiers, for brand owners, and ultimately for the consumer. And it's especially important during a pandemic. Um, the challenges actually brought about by the pandemic were immediate. So they were very rapid, they were unknown, and they were ever changing. It was, I mean, as they always said, it is unprecedented. This was never known, never done before. And so this really was new territory for all of us. So the new challenges faced by food business operations included supply chain disruptions, amongst other things. But the, But it was people that were most affected. And actually, it was the importance of staff health and safety, and the lack of staff availability and staff illnesses, staff isolating, staff had children to homeschool, staff staff needed PPE and actually there wasn't enough, they couldn't get it quickly enough. So there was lots of things that were impacting sites on food safety during the pandemic. And also we know actually that staff really even struggled to get to work. So there were and there still is severe restrictions around travel, local, national, and especially international travel. So there was lots and lots of questions. How on earth are food sites supposed to maintain social distancing on site? Who is an essential worker and who is not? And sites had to deal with these restrictions and these restrictions are changing all the time, changed by region, changed, changed depending on what part of the country you were. And this, of course, led to lots of confusion and delays and disruption. And yet, all along the time, the public were demanding for safe food. And this, this demand for safe food increased significantly in some sectors, such as the retail sector. So, in addition to all of that, some prerequisite services weren't so readily available. And one of those is pest control, which I'm going to talk about later but also things like waste disposal services, cleaning agencies were in huge demand, site staff and maintenance services were on furlough and so on. So all of these challenges were being faced by sites on their supply chains. So, but the pandemic has created a very clear prerequisite for all of us, and that is adapt how you operate your business or risk losing your business altogether. So with all of that going on, how were you expected to ensure effective oversight of your food safety management system when resources were compromised? Or another way of looking at it, with less staff on site, how do you ensure that your food safety systems are not at risk? Now, we know thousands of sites demonstrate their commitment to food safety by getting certificated to a GFSI scheme such as the BRCGS Global Food Standard. And maintaining that certification during the pandemic was not without its challenges. <clears throat> so today I'm just going to discuss some learnings that we observed over the last 12 months on how businesses adapted to ensure they maintained food safety and maintained their certification during the pandemic. There are many, many lessons to be learned from this pandemic and there's still more to be encountered as the pandemic continues its course. So of course, I can't cover all of these lessons today. So I'm just gonna focus on five main areas. The first is I'm, go I'm gonna talk about how BRCGS adapted its approach to auditing to ensure all sites had options to maintain their certification where possible. I'm going to talk about the use of ICT and digital platforms to help make the audit process feasible for both sites and auditors. Um, taking one of the prerequisites 
pest control management. And I'll just discuss some feedback that we had from two pest control companies on their lessons learned. And then I'm going to discuss briefly some of the known conformances raised during the pandemic, just to understand if we're seeing differences across sites as a result of the new audit approach that we took at BRCGS. And finally, I just want to discuss the importance of having contingencies for training when face-to-face -face training isn't possible. So the audit options. So I just want to talk how BRCGS adapted its approach to auditing and to ensure sites had options uh, to maintain their certification. So I'm just going to talk, um, and then I'm going to talk through actually some of the feedback we received from auditors and CBs. But firstly, I just want to quickly remind you of the additional audit options offered by BRCGS. So the audit options. So BRCGS offered uh, or launched a suite of audit options, and we took into account things like the GFSI position and the requirements. We took into account brand and retailer feedback, the changing and evolving local restrictions, delivery partner and auditor availability, and the maturity and history of the site certification. <clears throat> so just starting on the left-hand side with announced audits. The full on-site announced audit continues to be available where it's possible for an auditor to conduct an audit on-site. But a lesson we actually learned quite early on in the pandemic was that unannounced audits were in fact an unnecessary burden on sites. And actually they increased the challenge to certification bodies and auditors arranging the audits. So therefore, BRCGS took the decision to temporarily suspend the unannounced audit program until at least the end of this year. But where this is the case, the CB will contact the site to arrange an announced or blended audit. And we'll keep this temporary suspension under review and hope to restart unannounced audits as soon as possible. But don't worry, we'll give you at least three months notice before we re-offer this option. But if a site really needs an unannounced audit, this can be carried out by exception, for example. So if a customer requirement insists on it, or if perhaps it's part of a combined audit with another standard, then we will consider it. Uh, moving along the page to the blended audit. So the blended audit can occur where an on-site visit is possible. And the blended option is applicable to existing, existing sites only. And this, as you know, the audit takes place in two parts. We've got the, the remote online assessment of some or all of the documentation followed by the shorter on-site audit. And this provides an opportunity for a rigorous audit, but a reduction in the auditor time spent on-site. This has worked well, actually, where travel restrictions allowed auditors to visit a region or a country for a few days at a time before they had to quarantine. So for example, if an audit typically would take five days, but restrictions allowed an auditor to visit a country for a maximum of two days without having to quarantine, that's where the blended audit option worked well. And this will be a permanent option for announced audits in future. Now, the certification extension, this is where access is not possible and your audit is due. So where it's not possible to carry out an on-site audit of an existing certificated site, then the certificate may be extended for up to six months. Granting of this extension is based upon a risk assessment and a review. And that's between the site and the certification body. And it's based on the controls that are already placed in the site. And the extension is applicable for ex existing sites only. Now, the fully remote audit, we know this option is not GFSI benchmarked. It is available for sites where the certificate extension has expired and it's still not possible for an audit to take place due to COVID restrictions. Or it might be just where the site actually doesn't need a GFSI recognized certificate. And this, this remote audit includes a complete review of internal audits documentation and usually a video audit of the production and the storage facilities. Now, on top of that, we do actually offer a COVID-19 additional module. Um, so BRCGS have 
also published a separate assessment standard, which may be used at a time to provide assurances around the management of COVID-19 risks. It's done like a remote audit and focuses on the areas of the food safety system, which are potentially at a greater risk as a result of the changes enforced to address COVID-19. So just such as things like the supply chains. So just to conclude, BRCGS offered plenty of options to allow sites and CBs to work together to ensure food safety assurances are still in place during the pandemic. However, in order for these options, especially the remote and blended options to be successful, sites had to adapt their approach to the audit. So here's quite a detailed slide, but it's just a, I want to talk through it quickly. It's sort of a nine point checklist that BRCG, BRCGS offered certificated sites. And I just want to read them out really just to give you a flavor of what we proposed. And what you'll actually see later is that the feedback and the lessons learned pretty much mirrored a lot of these points. So just quickly start on point number one, the process. So this is all about you have to engage your staff in the planning of the audit, have training and practice in advance. Make sure that the right people are available throughout the audit, including the leadership team. Step number two was assess access support information. There's lots of information out there publicly available to help you with your remote audit. So go to your CB, look, go through ISO or even to the international accreditation form. Lots of great information available. Step number three, planning. Absolutely essential. Really identify who's going to be doing what. Is there a role for audit assistance to help maybe support the smooth running of the audit. Who's going to hold the camera? Who's going to gather all the evidence? And don't forget to plan in breaks from screen time, natural breaks, because a remote audit, it's very different. It can be much more intense in many ways. Step four, IT considerations. Now, you do have to test and map out your Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi signal. You have to have, and probably a great idea to have an IT person available throughout. Plan in advance how to share documents. Maybe set up a separate audit room. There's lots of planning that needs to be done there. Step five, preparation. So do a mock test of the equipment with internal and external people. Identify your weak Wi-Fi signals. Test the lighting on site is good enough so that actually the auditor is going to be able to see clearly from their remote screen, send them a map of the site so they know what, what the um, location is of everything. Step six, more planning, absolutely imperative. This time with your auditor in advance of the audit day. Try and identify what documents need to be ready or can be sent in advance. Step seven, company policies, particularly very important around site security policies, that site security policies of the auditor and the CB, and just make sure that all the systems are um, talking to each other and can be shared and accessed remotely. And we've actually had this sort of feedback several times from auditors where they've struggled with this. Step eight and nine, all about making, insu making sure that, you, that the outcomes of the auditor follow through as they should be. And particularly important is just Take any of the learnings that you've had from the audits and reuse them the next time. And that's, again, some feedback that we've had from auditors that the more they've done, the easier it's got. So, so we know approximately 20,000 food safety audits took part in the last 12 months and a small percentage were remote audits and blended audits. So I just wanted to share a little bit of how that's worked for us. So. This is about uh, maintaining supply chain confidence and fluidity. Remote audits are providing reassurance that suppliers are still operating to high safety and quality levels. Now, this is based on BRCGS or remote audits done globally. Now, apologies, this graph infographic is a little out of date. However, we, what we can see is that the, the increasing trend of remote audits there between September and December that took place across the globe. So in total, we had 662 remote audits and they were conducted in 73 countries across, across the globe. 
Of these, 46 were remote agents and broker audits, 78 were storage and distribution audits, 145 remote packaging material audits, and 355 remote food safety audits. Um, and we can just see it's split up by country and about 50% 50, 50 of those audits were conducted in Europe, 338 of them. So I guess the learning here is that sites, CBs and auditors got on board reasonably quickly with the new audit options available to them. And their confidence grew as they got used to this new way of working. And we can see that between the number of audits done in September right through to December. Now, as I said before, tip, in a typical year, approximately 20,000 or more food audits would be completed to the BRCGS food standard. Now, we did have a slight drop off initially during the pandemic, but actually that picked up as the year went on. And by January 2021, the number of audits completed were actually more or less the same year on year. Now, we can assume that there have also been less visits overall to sites by specifiers and customers. And the question is, has this led to complacency? Well, we'll cover off the non-conformances found during the pandemic later on. Now, I just want to talk in the next few slides about feedback from the auditors um, that actually conducted those remote audits. So here, I've just put some of the words up that they've used um, from them, from their experience of doing the remote audits. And the sort of things that they've said is actually, it was a bit of a culture shock for them as much as it was for the site. They didn't have much experience of ICT. They had issues with poor quality headphones. They hadn't really thought about um, investing in good equipment when they started off. Lots of talk about poor Wi-Fi, poor lighting on the site. And it was made more difficult for the auditor to be able to see the standards of of the construction and so on. It was it really kind of lots of lessons there. And auditors realized during the audit <clears throat> that actually they really rely on their senses to see, excuse me, <clears throat> to see and observe the environment and the interactions even between colleagues. They listen, they hear both a person's tone and they hear the interactions between employees. They smell, touch, are used. But these are actually obstructed during a remote audit. So a different challenge there. Also, some companies were nervous to release their documentation via email to an auditor using a Gmail account or a Google account. However, providing there are measures in place such as non-disclosure agreements or NDAs to protect security, this, this fear can actually be reasonably easily overcome. Auditors were initially quite skeptical about how video observations of facilities would work out, given that auditors will lose most of their senses except sight when viewing remotely. And the video presentation does not replace a walkthrough of the facility. You really need to be present on site to get the full experience of the culture of the company and its staff through its operational practices. But actually, video does afford some understanding of the process and the overall standard of construction and the equipment and gives you a good idea actually of what the house came in and the hygiene and the general operating standards are. Now we also did hear that some specifiers wanted the same auditor to do the remote audit instead of a new one because they are already familiar with the site layout and they know where the blind spots are. But then we also heard that new auditors were seeing new non-conformances because, because, well, they were less familiar with the site. So by having, and also another thing was by having the documentation in advance, this actually allowed the auditor time to do a more in-depth risk assessment. And therefore, actually, some sites saw an increase in documentation non-conformances. So actually, this was sort of top, five remote audit tips for sites and certification bodies. Um, so like I said, this is direct feedback now from some, from some of the auditors. Number one, preparation is key. 
So with, with the remote approach, preparation by the auditor is much more intensive around the pre-audit review of documentation. It's important, actually, for you to understand the pre-audit submissions, review the, re the previous report and understand the process so you as an auditor can request the right information beforehand. And although there's lots of similarities between the on-site and the off-site audit, remote document review generally requires information specified by the auditor to be uploaded onto a document portal or somewhere. So scanning rather than photographing and uploading documents can take some time. So auditors need to make sure that the company is aware before the audit day of exactly what information will be required. Of course, during the audit itself, they're going to need lots more documentation, so that will happen. So it's important actually to have a scanner available if possible. Number two, test your site IT is compatible with the certification body systems. So as compat compatibility can be an issue, the, the company needs to make sure the IT team is on hand on the day. It's very important that we've got the right people available on the day to help with any technology troubleshooting. Um, now, we all know video streaming can be poor when internet bandwidth isn't at its best. And of course, these, these audits are taking place all over the world in very remote locations where Wi-Fi and bandwidth is a problem. Um, so if you think it could be a problem, probably a good idea to uh, request a wired connection to a LAN or the Ethernet or some sort of router ahead of time so there aren't delays on the day. And you also just need to check in case the company firewall has any internal controls on screen sharing that need to be resolved in advance. Number three, test the technology in advance. So arranging a dry run in advance, if it's possible, is definitely recommended. The audit day time constraints on the auditor, they're tough enough already without the pressure of IT problems. And it also means the site and the auditor have a chance to get to know each other before the actual audit day. Um, another watch out is that many sites experience live streaming problems due to the Faraday cage effect that steel framed factories present. And just to get around this, maybe the company can upload a pre-recorded video requested by the auditor or present them via a shared screen. Now, if live streaming is possible, just be aware of the noise in the plant and how this can impact the auditor. And of, and of course, the auditor doesn't have control over the camera to where it's pointing. So a solution for this can be a team approach to the filming, maybe involving two or more people with a camera operator and a quality manager using separate devices. And another point is typically, the team on the audit day all sit around a table during the audit, which works well. However, when you're doing it remotely, placing the laptop in the middle of a large table to allow everyone to join in doesn't work so well during a remote audit, particularly if the microphone isn't picking up the sound and or if the meeting rooms are a bit echoey. So moving auditees closer to the microphone may cause social distancing issues. So it's probably better to have everyone logged into all into a maybe like an audit platform with headphones and individual microphones. Fourth point is get familiar with video conferencing. Throughout the pandemic, the use of video conferencing has really developed and everyone is now much more familiar with these systems. Certification bodies may have their own platforms, whether it's Microsoft Teams or Google or Skype or something that the auditors can be trained in and get familiar with. And then they don't have to actually deal with resolving any IT issues on the day. Um, and actually, they're also familiar with the system. They're not using some alien system on the day. Because actually, not knowing how an unfamiliar platform works, it's just extra hassle and extra stress for your auditor. And you don't want to have a stressed auditor. Um, fifth point, put a plan in place for poor Wi-Fi. Now, we've talked about this already, but if live streaming, if you are going to be live streaming your factory visit, and if it's not possible due to Wi-Fi, try pre-recording a, pre a video of the production facility. However, before you do this, you just also need to consider national privacy laws, and you must make sure that the video gives a good representation of the site. 
Now, it doesn't have to be cinema quality and try to avoid things like this nausea inducing rapid panning from one side of the factory to the other. Just think about what is it exactly that your auditor wants to see. Focus in on those details and perhaps following up the HACCP process flow diagram might be a good place to start the video. Try also maybe experimenting with different recording technology and, and avoiding the portrait style videos if possible. Um, a digital camera can sometimes be better than a phone camera as it's easier to transfer the videos onto a computer and so on. And actually, that brings me nicely on to my second lesson learned, which is all about the role of information communication technology. So lesson two, the role of information communication technology. So, well, we know technology has a vital role to play in our food supply chains. Businesses are increasingly turning to digital tools and platforms to support their challenges, using the power of data and automation to problem solve, maybe improve processes, and certainly to help decision making. And it increases productivity, it enhances transparency, and creates added value from all the way from operations right through to the customer experience. And the pandemic has certainly led to a dramatic increase in the use of some digital tools. Information communication technology, or ICT, has also been essential to the food industry. We know that remote audits could not have been possible without it. And it's been used to demonstrate food safety compliance to auditors and their pie, therefore helped maintain certification for hundreds of sites across the globe. However, as we said, that hasn't been without its challenges. So just to recap, we've talked about additional steps such as having confidentiality agreements or NDAs to be signed and just to consider documents such as the IAF ID3 or IAF MD4 docs need to be understood and agreed with your CB. And if you're not sure about these, just have a, have a chat with your CB about it. And sites had to learn where their Wi-Fi hotspots and black spots were in advance of the audit. And that's not something your typical technical manager knows anything about. And we've actually have heard of some extremely remote sites having just no Wi-Fi at all and making it impossible to, to conduct a live remote audit. Um, and we do know that just sites and auditors have used a huge variety of hardware and software, everything from smartphones, iPads, laptops, even CCTV. They've used GoPros, and then they've used WhatsApp, they've used Microsoft Teams, everything, anything and everything, some more effective than others. And I'll just probably talk about them a little bit later. Just moving on to digitalization. Now, ICT, however, doesn't in any way constitute digitalization. And this is usually an enterprise-wide project requiring investment and lots of detailed projects. Now, the pandemic has not necessarily accelerated digitalization in that respect. And it may, in fact, have slowed down the process in certain businesses. You know, companies maybe who had started the rollout of a digitalization project may have delayed it because the pandemic took priority. But having said that, companies that already had digitalization food safety platforms in place had a threefold increase in their use uh, because those customers realized they could effectively manage their compliance systems remotely using a full set of features that their digital platforms already offered. Or in other words, the pandemic encouraged digital users to exploit a digital-based compliance solution they already had. And this supports feedback that those using remote technologies to perform internal audits enhanced their control to mitigate food safety risks during the pandemic and at reiterating the importance of strong internal audits, especially when third-party audits weren't possible. So those who had digital systems were very grateful and it really made it a lot easier for them to, um, to sh share their documents with external auditors and it, um, it made the entire audit and remote audit experience much more effective. Um, 
Just another example, actually, of rapidly evolving digital tool used in the food industry is digital pest monitors. So these integrated pest management tools are critical, are a critical component of any food safety program. Um, tools such as rodent monitoring service sensors, they can protect operations from pest infestations and the related risks of disease and product loss and recalls and so on. And they can help ensure your site is audit ready and um, compliant with lots of the complex regulations associated with FISMA and the food safety standards. And actually, that just takes me on to my third lesson from the pandemic, which is pest control. So we all know that pest control is essential for food safety on site. Now, actually, this message was misunderstood at the beginning of the pandemic, which led to some pest control contact contractors not being allowed access to site initially. However, in the UK, after some lobbying by the Pest Control Association, they were granted essential worker status and then they were allowed into the sites. Um, of course, pest control, it's considered very hands on, a very hands on industry and it's you know, consider that you actually have to be on site to do it. However, this was challenged also during the pandemic, and now there are alternatives to some physical site, physical visits. Um, actually, pest contractors have said that rem remote pest audits can be done in the interim if a site is, if a site visit isn't feasible. And certainly things like trend analysis review meetings can certainly be done remotely which is better than not happening at all. But we have heard of occasions where pest contractors have not been given remote access to on-site pest control management systems, and that's mainly due to security reasons or hurdles. But this actually can be very easily addressed by NDA or confidentiality uh, co policies. What we do know is that monthly pest control visits have been maintained. Um, and there's been, I haven't really heard of many issues with that. But what I have heard is that field biologists weren't always allowed on site or their sites or their visits were being postponed. Um, actually, I heard some sites could end up not having a field biologist visit for nearly two years by the time the pandemic's over. Now, this does contravene clause 41410 of the food standard. Um, and I'm not, I'm not really clear why field biologists weren't weren't being allowed on site. I don't know. I mean, is it cost cutting or is it sites don't fully appreciate what the field biologist contributes or was it because the staff were being furloughed and they weren't there to action the report? I don't know. But certainly what I heard was there was a 35% reduction in, food, in field biologist visits from one contractor. And of course, that raises some concerns, not only from a food safety point of view, but also as a result of all those delayed visits, we're going to have that inevitable backlog of scheduled visits, and that now has to be managed. Um, so yeah, just the question, do sites fully appreciate the importance of your field biologist? Um, just on top of that, just to add to the concerns from um, pest control companies, we know that the some food sector saw a huge increase in production demand at the early stages of the pandemic. And if this is not managed correctly, this can lead to less time to clean and less downtime for maintenance and deep clean. And if you add in problems with stockpiling of raw materials and finished products and warehouse, this could result in, you know, place, more places for pests to harbour. And if that's not managed correctly, you're going to end up with these sudden emergency call outs, which are actually more costly for the site at the end of the day. And that's what we want to avoid. So. Um, I, I guess the other thing that's important to remember actually is when the lockdown happened, it happened very quickly. And some sites, they just didn't have a formal shutdown process. They didn't have time to implement a thorough shutdown process. And that led, could have led to some food safety prerequisites such as pest control not being managed correctly. And it's actually imperative that everybody has a reopening procedure implemented and followed for when sites or parts of the site are reopened. 
Um, just quickly um, to share with you um, pest sightings during the pandemic, whether they increased or decreased. So this was um, a survey conducted by the British Pest Control Association. And during the pandemic, they found that there was an, actually an increase, a 78% increase in rat activity and a 63% increase in mice activity. Um, now, this emphasizes the importance of rigorous compliance, especially around proofing and monitoring. It also emphasizes the fact that compliance isn't just for the audit. Sites must operate in accordance with the BRCGS food standard 365 days of the year if they expect to maintain a rigorous food safety management system. And, you know, if you have some parts of your site have been closed during the pandemic, it might actually benefit from a field biologist visit really to help you out um, with your reopening. Um, and also just there on the right, becoming pest ready, uh, another document by the British Pest Control Association uh, with some guidance on how to reopen your, your um, site. And that can be found on the British Pest Control Associ Association website. Okay, so moving on to um, non-conformities or a notable impact on their prevalence. Um, so the percentage of audits that contain certain non-conformances uh, we've recorded here, but I just want to put this into context. Um, so trying to understand if non-conformances differed during the pandemic was actually quite tricky because there was there was the added complication of comparing two untypical years. Um, for most site, sites, 2019 was their first issue eight audit, which was published in August 2018. So their first audit was actually 2019, and that always affects the pattern of non-conformances at sites because sites have got to get used to these new clauses and take some a bit of time to understand how to apply them to their facility. And then, of course, in 2020, we've had the pandemic. So we've actually had two consecutive years of potentially on typical data to try and trend. But if we look at the right hand side, apologies, these are a little bit small. Um, clause 1.1.2, food safety culture, was new in 2018, and that immediately was the top of the non-conformances. Um, it's relatively new for our industry. And similarly, with clause 2.7.1, the radiological hazard bullet point was new to sites and this caused some non-conformances. Um, but those moved, those um, the following year, if you look on the right-hand side, those actually non-conformances moved down to position three and five. So, um, but what we do see over the years is that the non-conformance have changed slightly and the top non-conformances um, there's not a huge amount of change at the moment. Um, to be honest, we haven't we haven't done the statistics on all of the remote audits yet, but we because we don't really have a significant number of audits completed to make the statistics meaningful. But what we will do is we would certainly continue to monitor that as the pandemic progresses. Um, just really to a bit bit more detail there for you on what those non-conformances were. Um, um, uh, those highlighted in grey were new clauses on issue 8, which scored high in 2019, but actually in 2020 we can see a reduction as sites got more familiar with the new clauses. And also interesting to see that 411.1, premises and equipment, is the worst offending clause, even with remote audits. So um, I'm just going to keep going because I'm just conscious of time. Um, here we're just talking again to show you more clearly the top non-conformances that were raised. Um, but what we can see is that the overall number of minor non-conformances allocated were slightly down year on year, but actually fairly consistent. So this suggests that despite all the challenges that sites are actually maintaining their food standard clauses is all re you know reasonably well. Uh, just this point, what I want to make here, this, this slide focuses on four main clauses. Now, the sites have to maintain their food safety standards during the pandemic, and they've had to make an awful lot of changes to their sites and, and operationally to comply to the new COVID rules. 
So we know sites had to focus on these four specific clauses, 2.14.1, 2.21, clause 5.1.2, and clause 4.11.3. What's useful here is that the standard gives them flexibility to change systems in a controlled way and therefore maintain food safety and risks. And this reinforces how the standard is designed to help sites to manage changes such as the pandemic. Uh, we don't really have time to focus on this, but just suffice to say that you know food safety wasn't the only issue during the pandemic. There's been lots of issues on food fraud, but not really. Don't really have time to focus on that today. And finally, just want to talk about training. Um, so one of the key lessons that the remote working definitely thrust virtual learning into the limelight, and this has had a huge impact in breaking down the geo graphical boundaries that have been traditionally associated with classroom learning. Um, if we look at the importance of having contingencies for training when face-to-face -face training is not possible, here's just a, um, a quick graphic of um, all of the locations where we've done a lot of our training at BRCGS over the last year. Now, BRCGS really took an early commitment, right? They were going to find ways of adapting to support our certificated sites to continue to develop their teams and actually to maintain this technical level of com competence. Sites that are more agile and more people centric, they will be much better positioned to bounce back stronger once this pandemic is over. So by adapting our content and our approach, we've redeveloped our courses to make them make sure that they're providing an even better online experience. So we've had to relook at how we do our training. We've had to adapt. We've had to change how we do it. Um, we've reframed the content to make it more um, online friendly. We've adapted our changing methods. So actually learners, learners are getting a, a much better um, experience out of the virtual classroom environment. Um, and um, like I said, we've redesigned our training and it's all now delivered through virtual platforms, totally critical. We've even looked at mobile micro learning and that's where we're developing these mobile friendly learning options. We've made it as easy as possible for people to learn. Um, and those platforms allow learners to target specific skill areas that really meets their, their requirements and their business and professional schedules. So we know virtual events. Um, we've, we've at BRCGS we've switched from traditional learning conferences to virtual. They've been a huge success, and actually we're going to continue to support our global network with virtual, in-person, and hybrids events in 2021. Uh, just very quickly, we're going to talk about um, BRCGS Professional. This is more just to show you that. Even in the last year, we've had a huge number of people um, doing their training virtually with us. So we've had 2,900 new professionals enrolled in our scheme in 2020. We've had 104 professionals graduate from the BRCGS Professional um, Academy. Uh, we've had 13 new countries join the professional uh, scheme. And this scheme, it's available exclusively to those who work at B BRCGS certificated sites. And it's been designed by our team. So, um, so it's great to see that uh, people have continued to use it during the pandemic. Uh, just finally, in case you need any more information about the pandemic, all of this is available on our website. If you just have a look at www.brcgs.com you find articles on business restart support, technical and compliance document, and lots and lots of guidance from government bodies and accreditation bodies. Um, and also just for clarity on our website, you will see our position statements all talking about our new audit protocol, procedures for blended audits, remote audit certifications, and clarifying unannounced audit. And just there on the right, you will just see um, our our COVID-19 uh, document that's available in all languages to help you manage your um, food systems during the COVID-19. Okay, so very quickly, in case you've been asleep for the last half an hour, I'm just going to do a very quick summary. Lessons learned. Um, what we've said is that um, the key lesson we've learned from the pandemic is that we had to adapt our ways of working to ensure we continue to provide brand protection for our customers. 
the remote audits and the blended process audit, they're working really well. Just remember, plan well in advance. ICT allowed the audit function to continue, test it out well in advance. Digitalization definitely had a part to play in demonstrating compliance and food safety. Pest control, as with all prerequisites, remain a priority. Do not lose focus on this prerequisite. Non-conformances, we have yet to understand the full impact, uh, but no significant changes. And virtual training, it's definitely here to stay and it's increasing all the time. So all that remains is for me to say a very big thank you for all of you listening. I know that was very quick, um, but if you have any other questions, uh, please let me know. Okay, thanks very much, Angela. Uh, if you switch your webcam back on, take the slides off. Uh, thanks for that overview. Uh, right, let's get to some questions um, and see how we go on. We've got 10 minutes left or so. So, Eggy, can you see that in the sidebar? Hi, for extended certification, how long is the active period of the certification? Can I do the certification more than once. Does that make sense? So I think, um, so if they, so they have six months to get the audit redone, but they, um, they can, um, so if it's delayed by up to six months and they do the audit, they, they, they can decide how long before they want to do the next audit. That's what I understand. Okay. So it's, um, they, they could do it if they want to get it back on to the original dates, then they can do it sooner, if they, the next one sooner if they want. Okay, makes sense. Uh, Irina, hi, do you think that remote auditing in the long term could affect food safety? Um, it, it depends on, I mean, remote audits only, you know, you have to really do a risk assessment to make sure that a remote audit is effective. I think there's two aspects to a remote audit. There's the there's a document side, and then there's the physical, you know, GMP visit and, and site. And I think maybe on the remote audit side, we can do more of that. There's there's definitely uh, more opportunity long term for that. But the the site visit, we all like to go in and see, and I think auditors still like to see the the go and yeah. visit the site. So, um, you know. I, I don't I don't see that being a long term. No, it's just not as efficient as it uh, or, no. or effective. Yeah. Uh, Francis Wallinson, it's just yeah. a comment this. I found using a selfie stick helpful, but I could not hear the auditor in a noisy environment. I had to retreat to a sheltered area to hear and answer the auditor's questions. Yeah. Yeah, we've had a lot of that feedback about um again, these are lessons learned. These are what people have been doing. They've tried all sorts of things and um it's good that um thanks for that feedback. Francis. Okay. Um I can see in the sidebar that was there was a question um about is it is it GFSI recognised remote audits and John yeah. John Figgins your colleague answered yeah. there and yeah. also about is it possible to have an unannounced audit and again John John answered there um, on that one. Okay. So. Yeah, I just <laughs> want to thank John for answering and helping me out. Um, yeah. Teamwork makes it a lot easier. Yeah. Okay, and uh, for Tini, do you believe that remote audits will not provide full control to the operator to maintain the quality of food and its safety? Well, it's the same question as before. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. Okay, and uh, Albert, um, what's Albert saying? Interest, interested in our presenter's thoughts on the amount of certification assessments due. Once the pandemic restrictions de decrease to safe levels, CB resources for assessments and preparations for the number of on-site assessments that are due. Yeah, I mean, this is about the backlog, I guess, you're talking about. Um, uh, well, what we have seen is actually if there's been a, the, you know, we've still done a lot, a lot of audits have still happened. I mean, there will be a bit of a backlog, but I, I, I don't think it's going to be as bad. What companies have to do or what specifiers have to do is to actually prioritize which ones are more important. So the ones that are high risk, for whatever reason, should be prioritized. Yes, we expect that there will, there might be a little bit of a backlog, um, but of course, 
we can't all rush at once because we can't overwhelm these sites now with lots and lots of audits. That's the last thing that they need. What we want is to do this in a controlled way, prioritise those that are high risk or that truly need a visit rather than ones that you feel are probably less less of a risk. Okay. But, um, something that we are in discussions with, with um, specifiers. Okay, thanks, Angela. Uh, Aria, impossible to implement virtual audit at remote area and poor internet or Wi-Fi. How about manual audit, but the audit team follow the COVID-19 health protocols? And I think John has said, where an on-site audit is permitted, for example, due to travel restrictions, then an on-site audit remains an important audit choice that the site can make, and it remains available for all sites, especially those where Wi-Fi or other restrictions prevent blended or remote auditing. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah. really this is about we don't want to put anybody in a, um, you know, we want to make sure that nobody's health and safety is at risk here. This is first and foremost, it's the health safety of the auditors mm -hmm. that we have to consider. So we're not going to insist or so specify as we hope aren't insisting on, on you know, insisting auditors go in and do an audit if it's not safe. But it is, if it is safe and if it's possible, yes, absolutely go and do an announced audit. Okay. Uh, Isabel, uh, question for on-site audits. How do we deal with auditors who refuse to follow COVID protocols? Oh. We had one last year who refused to wear a mask inside the office, would only wear PPE inside production. <laughs> Oh, right. I think the, you'd need to discuss that with your CB, so whoever yeah. you've um, agreed, agreed. I mean, all auditors, I think, now are fully versed in the, in the protocol of auditing and mask wearing. It depends how early on and, and which country that is. Um, different, different countries have different rules or different regions have different rules. But we would hope that if you've got any issues like that, speak to your CB. They should be able to address it. Yeah. Um, Luke. Tete, does remote audit show the actual situation, I think? Well, we, we know it doesn't, it's not perfect, but no. actually right now it's a very good option available. Um, I mean, and in some areas, what like I've said, the feedback that we've had on some audits is that the remote gives the auditor a bit more time to look at some of the documentation, and that's helped. Um, of, of course, I mean, we all know the ideal is that the auditor is on site. Yeah, and perhaps talking to individuals and things on the site is, it's just face-to-face yeah. -face is better, isn't it? We all know, but we're yeah. making the best of a bad situation. Exactly. Rachel, auditors are required to follow our building rules. If they refuse, can we refuse to let them into the building? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, again, these sort of discussions you should be having with the CB, mm. your, your certification body, because... Um, you know, we've been we've worked very closely with um, the certification bodies to make sure, and, and they have as well, and making sure that everyone follows the rules. Um, it seems unusual to hear that auditors are refusing. Again, I don't know what those rules are. It's, I can't. Difficult for me to comment, but I would suggest that you just speak to your certification body. Yeah, and they, they will definitely help. Okay. Um... I can't see any more questions. Just thanks for the valuable information. Thank you for the presentation. It was very helpful. Great information. Thanks a lot and happy weekend. Thanks for all the information. Any further questions? We've just got a couple of minutes left uh, with Angela. No, I mean, if you've got any more inquiries or any questions, just, um, you know, send your inquiries straight into inquiries at brcgs.com. Um, team there will be very happy to answer any questions. Anything yeah. on any questions on training or anything about our director? We've got our um, our emails were on the on the presentation, which you'll all get a copy of. Correct. So thank you very much. Yeah. On that note, uh, yeah. Thanks very much, uh, Angela. Uh, first time here welcome. with us. Uh, hope it won't be the last. <laughs> Certainly won't. Thank you very much, everybody. I wish you luck. Have a great weekend. Brilliant. All right, Angela. Take thank care. You. We'll see you soon. Uh, I'm just going to load your certificate in the sidebar because if you get a little certificate of uh, oh. attendance, uh, you have to sign it yourself. Uh, you have to print and sign it or open it in an image editing software and put your name on it. I uh, can't really do it for hundreds of people. Um, it's free. Uh, okay. Thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, have a great weekend and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Take care. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.